Good morning, village people. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at the village. It's an honor to be here with you this morning on this uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. Glad to see you all awoken from your post-Thanksgiving slumber and, uh, and are here with us this morning. I hope you're awake. I hope two of you, this is going to be great fun then. This is going to be great fun. Um, if you're new here with us this morning, if you're here for a baptism or a guest with us, um, thanks so much for being here. Inside your bulletin, there's a connect card and a prayer card on the other side of that. And so we'd love to invite you to fill that out and you can turn that in at the table outside the doors on your way out this morning. Uh, last week we wrapped up a series called Here for Good, and, and for us it's been a, a campaign to move toward our more permanent home. And I wanted to share with you something really cool that happened on our property yesterday. I got an email, it's been a couple months ago, from, uh, from Harry. Harry's a young man here in our church, and, uh, and he said, I think it's about time for me to ask Amanda, my girlfriend, to be more than my girlfriend. I don't want to ask her to marry me, and I can't think of a more fitting place to do that than on our property at the village because it's been such an important part of our relationship and we know that the church will be a really important part of our marriage. And so yesterday afternoon, I think I have a picture, this happened on our property. Uh, I just, I was so excited about it and wanted to show it to you. So this is, uh, she said yes, which is really good. Um, I think they're going to be at the 1030 service, so I'll get to ask Amanda for sure to make sure she said yes. But um, so you see the, the H&A, Harry and Amanda sign in the background, but zoom in on that because I want you to see what, what he put on. He put here for good on the sign, which I think is really, really awesome. Next Sunday is an exciting day in our, in our here for good kind of campaign. It, it's the big announcement Sunday where we'll be announcing the grand total for our campaign for the land. And so I'm super excited about that and to get to share that with all of you. Uh, I want to add my prayers into the morning. So let's pray. God, thank you for who you are, for all the ways that you're at work. As we gather here today, God, I am aware, not only in the room, but in my, in my own spirit, I'm aware that we have come from many different places this week. For some of us, family meals were a joy, and for some of us, family meals were an extreme stress, and, and we're all over the map, and, and I pray that no matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves right now, God, that you would meet us here and that you would speak to us a word that we need to hear, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So this story that Barb read for us a minute ago, just some of the backstory on that, at the end of the book of Genesis... The people of God, the Israelite people, have gone over to Egypt because there was a great famine in their own land. And so they went over to Egypt to try to find food. They actually, through, uh, through their brother Joseph, there's a story of Joseph. You've heard maybe of Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. So a long story there. It's at the end of Genesis. Great story. But Joseph has favor with the Pharaoh, with the king of Egypt, and he gets his family into this privileged position in Egypt so that they can have all the food that they need and everything that they want. And then the story ends in Genesis and Joseph dies. And the beginning of the book of Exodus, it says a new king came to power who did not know Joseph and did not remember his family. And so what you read about at the beginning of the book of Exodus is that the people of God who came to Egypt to find food now find themselves in slavery. And they have been in slavery for 400 years. It's been a hard 400 years, and they find themselves in slavery. And in Exodus chapter 3, I read this last week if you were here, in Exodus chapter 3, God comes to Moses and he says, I've heard the cry of my people, and I've come to rescue them, to deliver them from slavery, to bring them out of Egypt, and to bring them back home. And Moses is a shepherd. He's out in the desert. He's minding his own business. And for whatever reason, God decides to use Moses as the instrument to bring the people out of slavery. And so then these amazing things happen. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, God performs all these signs and miracles and wonders and puts all this amazing power on display. And Pharaoh finally lets the people go. And so Moses takes the people away from Egypt and they approach the Red Sea. And then they find that Pharaoh has changed his mind and the entire Egyptian army is coming out after the people of God. They're chasing after them to try to bring them back. And so the people of God are trapped between the army of Egypt and the Red Sea see. And God does something else just amazing and miraculous. And Moses lifts this 
shepherd's stick that he has, and God parts the water of the Red Sea, and the Israelite people walk across on dry land, and the water crashes back over, and they are safe, and it's amazing, and they are overjoyed, and they live happily ever after in awe of all the signs and the wonder and the power that God could ever put on display, and they are always and forever grateful for everything that God has ever done for them, except for that's not how the story goes. Most of that is how the story goes. It's the last part where I got excited and my voice went up a little bit. That part of the story is not how the story goes. They cross through the Red Sea. They've been freed from slavery after 400 years of torturous labor. And they immediately begin complaining. <laughs> they immediately begin complaining. Exodus chapter 16, that's where, we, that's where we find ourselves today. We're in Exodus chapter 16, and the people start complaining after they've seen God do all these amazing things, deliver them from slavery, and the first thing they do is say, we don't have anything to drink. Where's the water? And so God provides them clean water to drink, and they, you know, they drink to their heart's content. And as soon as God does that, what do they do? They complain. They start complaining. We don't have anything to eat. There's no food here. Did you bring us out in the desert to starve us so that we could die? And so Moses goes to God and says, we don't have any food. We're hungry. It's Thanksgiving. There's supposed to be a lot of dressing here. And God says, I'm going to do this amazing thing, and I'm going to provide bread from heaven, which is called manna in the book of Exodus. And, and it says, every morning the people went out and they found this dew on the ground, and they would go out and they would collect it and it would turn into this kind of honey tasting grain thing that they were able to bake into these cakes every single morning. And it says they had, not only did they have uh, enough to eat, but they had enough to eat to their fill. And on Fridays they could go out and they could get two days worth of food and God would provide that. And it happened morning after morning after morning. You turn over to Numbers chapter 11 and it goes into a little bit more detail about the story. So God's been providing this manna, this bread from heaven. Imagine that. Imagine walking out every day and having exactly what you need from God. How incredible would that be? And here's what the people do. In, in Numbers 11, it says the rabble. I like that word, the rabble. Sometimes churches have some of that. We don't at the village. There is no rabble at the village. Some churches do, not this one. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks. Oh, the, I mean, when's the last time you cried out for leeks? <laughs> I never have, but maybe I'll start. The onions and the garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. And I, I love this. This is what they say. We never see anything but this manna. Imagine that God is providing you manna from heaven and you walk out every morning and there's this dew on the ground that turns into bread and it fills you uh, fully, right? You don't need anything else to eat. What would you do? Well, if you're like the Israelite people, the first thing you would do is say, all we have is this manna that God is providing. We want some meat. The story goes on and God says, okay, I hear you're complaining. I'm now going to give you quail. I'm going to give you so much quail that you're going to be tired of quail. There will be quail coming out of your nostrils. It says that in Numbers 11. I love it. And it goes on. It goes on, and Moses begins to argue with God. Moses says, God, this is a horrible idea. You can't do this. Moses says, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, God, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Like Moses turns into a, a middle schooler here. And then he says, would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Moses is saying, God, you can't do this. And it says, the Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short now you will see whether or not 
what I say will come true for you. Is the Lord's arm too short? I love that phrase. I could do a whole sermon. On, in fact, at six o'clock this morning when I was rereading this text, I thought I might do a completely different sermon just on that question. Is the Lord's arm too short? Have you ever been in a situation where you doubted the ability of God to do whatever it was that you needed and whatever it was that you asked? And I imagine God saying back, is the Lord's arm too short? Is there anything that I can't do? That's a side sermon. I'll do that on a different day, but I want to pick back up here here, back to the story, the people are complaining. They are grumbling. And, and I'll admit it, I can kind of understand that, right? I can understand the reason for the grumbling. Sometimes life is really hard, right? Sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go. Sometimes, maybe this is just me, but sometimes you have an idea in your head of exactly how things are supposed to go. And then when they don't turn out exactly the way you planned them or thought about them or dreamed about them, then you can start to complain and you can be justified in doing that. Am I right? Sometimes you feel like you've been shortchanged in life. Sometimes you get Thanksgiving out. Has anybody ever felt thanksgiving out? Maybe you felt that on Thursday after your third meal of the day, right? thanksgiving out. But maybe it's not just the food. I mean, there is, there is so much talk about thankfulness this time of year. Is there not? I mean, every, every small group meeting, every church small group starts with the question, now tell us what you're thankful for. Every Thanksgiving meal, maybe not every Thanksgiving meal, but so many Thanksgiving meals start with this tradition of now that it's time to eat, before we eat, let's go around and everybody say something they're thankful for. And I want to say, I'm thankful that we were about to eat. Oh, I wanted to eat the food. I don't want to be... Kids, uh, at night when parents put you to bed, we said, now tell us what you're thankful for before you go to sleep. Kids' ministries create gratitude jars, and we want parents to fill them up with things that we're thankful for. Everybody posts these ridiculous pictures of their smiling families, and you know that it's not a real picture, right? You, you know that it's not real. They're not really smiling like that all the time. You might think this morning that somebody who went to, to grad school at Vandy and whose wife went to grad school at Vandy might come in on a morning like this and gloat about a victory and be thankful, <laughs> right? You might think that would happen in a place like this on a day like this, but I'm here to tell you, what, what is it? Is it something I said? What? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I really couldn't resist. <laughs> Sometimes, some of you are about to walk out, right? I see, I know who you are. You're nodding your head, right? But sometimes you get thanksgiving out. People post quotes about hashtag thankfulness and how they're hashtag thankful and they come to church expecting sermons about thankfulness and it's possible in this season to get thanksgiving out. Now, thankfully, see what I did there? Thankfully, we have a lot of stories in the Bible about people who are grumbling and complaining and there are some things that we can learn from them. And so I've put together my top six ways to develop ingratitude. Not to develop in gratitude. Amanda asked me yesterday, what are you preaching about tomorrow? I said, I'm going to talk about developing ingratitude. She said, oh, developing ingratitude is a good thing to do. And I was like, no, 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 ingratitude. I want to talk about developing ingratitude. So here are six ways. You, you've got a bulletin with a blank space for notes. Take notes. These are great things. The six my top six list of how to develop ingratitude in no particular order. Number one, get that pen out. I don't hear it clicking. Number one, always compare yourself to other people. If you want to develop ingratitude, you should always compare yourself to other people. Not just the real stories of people, but look at the Facebook posts of people, and then you compare your real life to the highlight reel of the other people. Always compare yourself to other people. Number two, complain at every opportunity. Complain at every opportunity. Bonus points if it's on social media. Bonus points to the bonus points if you can turn the tide of an entire conversation on Facebook to where it becomes negative. Bonus points to the bonus points of the bonus points if you can complain in that thread about how Nolensville has too many burger joints already. <laughs> because if you've been on the Nolensville 411 recently, you'll see that that's the talk of the town, right? Complain about 
everything at every opportunity. Number three, only pray for yourself. In fact, only spend on yourself. Only focus on yourself. If you missed Black Friday, don't worry. Tomorrow is Cyber Monday, and you should skip Giving Tuesday. Only spend on yourself and pray for yourself. Number four, always focus on how it used to be. If you want to develop ingratitude in your current circumstances, always focus on the way that it used to be. Number five, assume that you did it all yourself. Never say thankful. If you have a thankful thought, you just leave that on the inside. Always assume that you did it yourself. And finally, number six, my favorite, focus as much as you can on the bad habits of other people. And in case you can just write H-A-B-I-T-S, I've got a little acronym for you to help you remember habits. Focusing on the bad habits of other people. H, horrible. Only think about the horrible things that people do. A, annoying. What's the most annoying thing about the person sitting next to you right now? Uh, B, bothersome. I, irritating. T, terrible. And S, stupid, right? What are, the, what, what are the horrible, annoying, bothersome, irritating, terrible, stupid things about the people in your life? Only focus on those bad habits. If you will do these six things, I guarantee that you will develop a healthy sense of ingratitude. Let us pray. I'm kidding. <laughs> you're like, what is, especially if you're new here, you're like, what is going on in this church? I have no idea. Here's the thing. Here's, here's the problem with ingratitude. Here's the problem with ingratitude. It's not how we're designed to live. We are not designed to live a life of ingratitude. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in at least two ways. The first is, is biblically. For those of us who are, who are followers of Jesus, we're instructed directly to live a life that's the opposite of ingratitude. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5 Paul writes this, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Not only does ingratitude not work biblically, it also doesn't work scientifically. There are scientific studies that show when we live a life of ingratitude, it affects us emotionally, relationally, socially, psychologically. Uh, the Templeton Foundation has done a, a lengthy study on gratitude and thankfulness recently, and here are some of the things that it found about gratitude. People who show gratitude have 10% less stress-related illnesses. People who live a life filled with gratitude, their blood pressure is lower by 12 to 16%. Uh, people who live a life filled with gratitude have an income that's 7% higher. And they keep saying thank you for that. I, uh, youth and children, youth and children who live a life of gratitude and who are taught to live a life of gratitude have 20, are 20% 20 more likely to get A's in school. Don't use that as a punishment, by the way. You will be grateful. Or you can go to your room. Like, I don't know that it works like that. Teens who live a life of gratitude and are taught a life of gratitude are 10 times less likely to use tobacco and alcohol. People who live a life of gratitude have 10 to 15% more and better sleep. People who live a life of gratitude give 20% more of their time and their money to causes outside of themselves. They rank themselves as 25% happier, and gratitude can add up to seven years to your life. Living a life of ingratitude is not how we're designed to live. It doesn't make sense biblically. It doesn't make sense scientifically. Now, here's the good news for you this morning. If you consider yourself to be a person who struggles with gratitude, if you consider yourself not to be a very grateful person, if you have some work to do on the gratitude scale, it's also been scientifically shown that you can develop gratitude just like you can develop muscles by working out. You can develop gratitude with practice. Here are two things I want to leave you with uh, in terms of developing the ability to be grateful and aptitude for gratitude. Number one, do this. Remember, 
Simply remember what you're thankful for. That's what's going on in the Exodus story. The people in the Exodus story have forgotten who they are, and more importantly, they've forgotten who God is. They've immediately forgotten all the things that God has done for them. Their ingratitude is a result of spiritual amnesia. They have spiritual amnesia, and it leads them to complaining and grumbling. And one of the ways to beat ingratitude is to remember what God's already done for you. Think about that. What are the things that God's already done for you? If you have trouble with that, how many of you have taken a breath since we've been in here for worship? <laughs> Look around. If you see somebody not raising their hand, I'm concerned. <laughs> Nudge them, right? The air in our atmosphere and our lungs are designed perfectly <laughs> to work together to provide your body what it needs. You and I take 23,000 breaths every single day. 23,000 breaths that God has designed to work to make our bodies run efficiently. If you're not sure what to be grateful for, start there. Thank God for one of those 23,000 breaths. Remember, the second thing is simply this, express your gratitude. Remember what you're grateful for, what you're thankful for, and express your thankfulness. I want to show you a video. This was on Soul Pancake. This is part of a, a smaller part of a larger video. And people were instructed, they came into a room and they were instructed to write a letter to somebody expressing why they were thankful for them. And then as part of that, they didn't know this, but after they wrote the letter, uh, then they were instructed to call the person and to read them the letter. Some pretty awesome stuff happened with that. I want you to check it out. Just a couple minutes of this. All right, so I've got to read you this paragraph. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, All right. sweetheart. All right. The person that influenced me the most would be my mother, Marlo Dawson. She is a single mother of two. She is a very hard worker and dedicated to her family. Hey, Craig. This is Loie. Um, this is going to be a funny little voicemail, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm so sorry for calling you at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I have to read this to you, okay? And you can't say anything or, I don't know. You can respond, but I probably will just keep going. <laughs> okay? Is everything okay? Yes, but I have to read this out loud to you. The person who has had the biggest impact on my life outside of Jesus Christ, who was responsible for my existence, was my college accounting instructor. He had a joy and enthusiasm for his job like no other teacher I have ever known. I love her to death, and she keeps me going with positive talk she is a woman that knows what she wants and won't give up until it is achieved. Oh, thank you. I, I, I don't know what, I'm not the cry because it's so beautiful. I, 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 have, I have to say that it's just wonderful. I first met Craig on an independent feature film set in Whitefish, Montana. I recently have been sending Craig a lot of positive thoughts as he suffered a series of health problems. Despite his medical problems, he's continued to work and take pleasure in the small things in life, like sitting quietly with, with his wife, Janine, on the porch. Erica is my older sister and my best friend. <laughs> Sometimes it even feels like we are twins. She's my number one fan and my number one supporter. She makes me happy because despite all my mistakes and my decisions, she still loves me no matter what. Your friendship is everything. And you are, you are one of the most important person in my life. Even when she has a kid and many children, I will love her more than her kids. Okay, maybe not. I will never forget when she flew 3,000 miles at the drop of a phone call to save me from a breakup. I'm being blessed by having a son like you. I love you. Bye. Why did you do that to me? <laughs> I don't know because they made me do it. <laughs> Thank you for picking up. Bye, sweetie. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Remember what you're thankful for and express that thankfulness. Now, here's the deal this morning. I don't want us to just think about this 
and talk about this and watch a video where other people do this, but I want us to take some time and some space this morning to practice this. And so we're going to have a time of communion and prayer as we do uh, every week here at the village. And here's what I want to invite you to do during this, uh, even before you come forward to receive communion, maybe. I want you to pull out your phone. (laughs) I want you to pull out a piece of paper. or You can use the back of your bulletin. And right now I want to invite you to do one of a few things. Uh, Number one, I want you to remember somebody that you're thankful for. Remember somebody that you're thankful for. And I want you right now, during this time and during this place, I want you to pull out your phone and I want you to send them a text and tell them why you're thankful for them. Or maybe you can email them and tell that person why it is you're thankful for them this morning. Maybe, maybe somebody in here this morning feels compelled that you need to walk out of the room and you need to pick up your phone and you need to make a phone call right now to let somebody know why you're thankful for them. If you don't have a phone with you and if you don't want to you know, do it that way and you want to give it some more thought, I want to encourage you to take the back of your bulletin. Right? Take the back of your bulletin. There's a spot on there or you can use the front and jot down some thoughts or some notes. And commit that today, in order to express your thankfulness, you're going to call that person or you're going to write that person or you're going to text that person and you're going to let them know why it is that you're thankful for them today. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus.